I'm going to make sure I have security because I know I have had attempts on my life and I have too much work to do. So suck it up and defunding the police has to happen. We need to defund the police and put that money into social safety nets. These folks back there have lost their mind. You've lost your minds. You are the ultimate knuckleheads and because of what you are saying and standing for, can you explain your relationship with Epstein? Did you have any concerns? Uh, was there ever any concerns you had about it? Oh, certainly. Uh, you know, I had several dinners with him. Uh, there are reports the administration wants to require all foreign visitors to be vaccinated. Would that include migrants? There are NGOs and other international uh, organizations who are vaccinating uh, migrants. Uh, if you want that decoded... No, it doesn't include migrants, and they are streaming across the border, and it is, uh, we are overwhelmed and we are without, sorry, overwhelmed and we are without answers. That is what that answer really meant from Jen Psaki. Oh, goodness gracious. Let's start off, let's go in order, Alice. First with Cori Bush. This is Cori Bush, who took a big victory lap. She's a... One of the new members of the squad who got it in 2020. She's a psychotic like the rest of them. It, she, she's perfect because she was born of the apocryphal tale of um, Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. Hands up, don't shoot. That never happened. When Michael Br Brown, after uh, going on an own, a little crime spree, then tussled with an officer, tried to grab his gun so he could shoot him dead. And... Um, and was found, the officer was not found to be in the wrong. He was, I guess you could say, cleared, exonerated. It was called a good shooting, whatever, by Eric Holder at the time. Um, so then she uses that to be a Black Lives Matter um, person and then uses that to win the election here and then uses that, of course, in the Great Racial Reckoning to, um, to use her activist skills, and she's got those, Mm -hmm. to intimidate the Biden administration, even though they said earlier in the day yesterday that they couldn't revive the uh, landlord, the eviction moratorium. The, they said earlier they capitulated and broke down, and they did anyway later in the day. Mm -hmm. And they've, even though they said, he said, well, he said, well, he said it, that it's not going to be, it's probably not going to be constitutional. And it's not, it, it's going to get tossed out. But they did it anyway. They're so afraid of people like Cory Bush. And now she said this cut is about her saying that she needs she needs security because she's important. She has important things to do, so she has to have security. But you can't have the cops protect you and screw you. And she's on to defund the police. That'll be the next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm it, just upset that she stopped at a uh, rent and eviction moratorium. <laughs> I think she should stay on the Capitol steps until she gets our mortgage payment canceled, too. That's right. I don't think she's going to do no because because people, people who, have who own houses are yeah, not her. They don't get it, or not all people. Actually, maybe just some people. She could do that for and get some school college loan debt. Um, yeah, but you know the, what? The, the, maybe Congress should just quit this whole legislating thing because yeah. it seems like that's not really as effective an approach as much as just hanging around outside of Congress and complaining on the steps while you so eat Oreos it, until you get the president to just override which is Congress in does. incredible that they could do this. This this maximalist approach it absolutely works for them. Absolutely. So people like she and AOC, they're seeing now, and she gloated on her social media. She's just all thrilled about it. They're seeing that and this is why they're so dangerous. And people say they have no sway or juice, whatever, in mm -hmm. that they're in, in Pelosi only has really a majority of three at this moment because there are some empty seats. That's not true. They've got all the juice. Like you said, they can circumvent Congress, the legislative body, completely. Yeah. And they can control the executive branch. I mean, I hope the country lasts until 2022 because this is like not a good scene no this is crazy and alice and i don't think people should underestimate these people cory bush is not a smart person mm -mm. she's an idiot uh, AOC, but she's an effective person well, well yes that's what i'm getting at aoc okay. it doesn't know anything okay mm -hmm. uh, uh same with the guy in um who's that one of the new members of the squad a guy in new york out of new york as well Jamal Bowman? Maybe it is him. Maybe it is him. But um, but these people, as we've said, they're really good activists. 
Mm -hmm. They know how to get out there, intimidate, get in your face, make noise, and use social media to amplify at a rate that old people in, in the Biden administration could never dream of. Well, and I think actually that being dumb is sometimes like and not knowing or caring how things work can sometimes be actually an asset because, you know, you're not like paralyzed with any burdens of knowledge about how the system works and the paths you have to go through and the reasons why you shouldn't do an eviction moratorium. I mean, right. you know this from having jobs too, is like a lot of times like you can just sort of fake your way into jobs that you like don't really know what you're doing and if you're bold why enough... Why do you use me for this example though? This is the general you. Oh, okay. <laughs> it means anybody. Okay. Feels personal. <laughs> that, you know, that you just don't even know mm -hmm. all the reasons why you shouldn't be able to do the thing. And, like, a lot of people are like, no, you don't understand. You can't just go out and do this. You have to do this and that and be prepared with this thing and that thing and do... Or, like, when we bought a house together, our first house, and we didn't know what we were doing, mm -hmm. and, like, we should have, like, had things saved up and be prepared for this and that and closing costs, and we, like, literally just didn't know anything. We were just, like... Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, we'll fill out that form. Let's see what happens. And then, like, somehow they gave us a house at the end of the process. Oh, no. Like, uh, yes, absolutely. They, you're absolutely right about that. It but, like, me. we weren't prepared. And no. we have friends that, like, are, are, like, we're not really in a position to buy a house yet. Da, da, da. Like, we haven't got all our ducks in a row. And we just, like, winged it. And it was fine, actually. But I think this type of activism is a lot like that. Is there, like, yeah. oh, what do you mean you can't do an eviction mortgage? No, you just have to do one. I'm just going to sit here until you do oh, it. Oh, it's, it's totally impassioned <laughs> idealism. All that matters is that she knows that the landlords are the oppressors and the tenants mm -hmm. are the oppressed. And that's all you need to know, especially if you're a little Marxist. That's all you need to know. And you're right. So she doesn't know. She doesn't know why you wouldn't do something. She doesn't know or care that circumventing the executive branch, one, is going to get your uh, measure blown out by the Supreme Court quickly or another court. And she doesn't know, too, that that creates a bad precedent and that this stuff could be used in, in author, total authoritative uh, measures and that you can't have things like this whatsoever. She doesn't realize... Yeah. You... No, it's like a child running the government. I declare mm -hmm. everybody will get ice cream now. Like, they don't know what happens to supply chains if you give everybody free ice cream or right. whatever and she out hangs there. Out with like, the no, I'm that... just giving everyone free ice cream. I'm doing it now. Right. And she also doesn't re know that what the political ramifications of something like, like this. Mm -hmm. you know, Democrats own rental units too. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you wanted, you're doing something here where you're vilifying, first of all, and people know that these people are—they want to abolish rent totally. Yeah, they totally run well into Well, because if you look at the replies of her thing, she tweeted, On Friday night, I came to the Capitol with my chair. I refused to accept that Congress could leave for vacation while 11 million people faced eviction. For five days, we've been out here demanding that our government acts to save lives. Today, our movement moved mountains. There's a chance, Alice, if you think about it, mm -hmm. there's a chance that some landlords will have to leave their properties before their tenants do. Uh, yeah. What an incredible thing. I guess, you know what, Alice? Let's just keep, we'll use the Noodles Inc. version. Make the tenants the owners. Problem solved. Yeah, I mean, they effectively are now anyway. So, but do the uh, original landlords still have to, like, fix the roof or the boiler? Yes. And show up and fix the plumbing if yes, it breaks. Yes, even though they're now just a tenant. If that. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Just, just wondering. Time to make sure. She also tweeted today. This is the kind of brilliant things you can get on Corey Bush's Facebook feed. So I was looking for this. I saw this gem. We're building a politics of love. Because I love you. I care that you have food to eat. I care that you have a roof over your head. I care that you have what you need to thrive. That's how our government should work. Excellent. <laughs> a government by the song Imagine by John Lennon. There you go. You deserve to have what you need to thrive, Tom. Cory Bush loves you and is looking out for you. <laughs> but, I mean, like, in, and she's not going to lose her seat in Congress. So, 
you know, before I'm going to head off any emails we get asking how we can, like, stop her or what her opponent is to donate to or whatever. Like, it's a Democrat plus 29 district. She's not going anywhere. That's I mean, She can be elected. She could be the next Speaker of the House. For all, although that's actually going to be Catherine Clark is probably going to be the next Speaker of the House. Uh, our local congresswoman. The next Democratic yeah. Speaker of the House. Well, so the rumor is that Biden's considering Pelosi for an ambassadorship to the Vatican. And Catherine, fact, didn't the Vatican just yell at her? Maybe, but uh, you know, since when has Biden and Pelosi cared about sticking it to Catholics? Do you think the young guns want Catherine Clark to run the place? She's the assistant speaker right now, so she's. I it's not about young guns, though. It's about organizing power and favors and knowing the right people and being in the right places at the right time. And Catherine Clark is the master of that. She's the. Like, she shows up to the right people's fundraisers. She does the work for the right people. She gets in. That's why she's, like, this nothing congressperson who does absolutely nothing, and she's the assistant speaker of the House. She's Pelosi's uh, groomed heir to the whole speakership It thing. would be wonderful to see her not be the next speaker. Yeah. But So, I mean, I know somebody who has... I mean, since Catherine Clark was a state rep, believed that she was going to be the uh, first woman president of the United States. And uh, I must be missing something. I mean, I don't know. Enough. Not not. I mean, because that person likes her, but because she just like, no, she's just a climber and knows how to get on the right ladder. There's at another the right climber time. in line to be president of the United States, Alice. And yeah, but they're having emergency meetings to try and figure out how to salvage her reputation because she's go into that such a, a disaster. This is uh, Kamala Harris, who has been... She's had a rough six months, I would say, or half a year so far. You know, that big piece came out. So was that in the Atlantic? The, the Axios. Big, in Axios. They talked about the disarray within her staff. That oh, no, all... I don't know what that one might have been. I don't know what that one was. The one that I sent you today about the big oh, meeting okay. to try and salvage her reputation is Axios. Okay. Okay. So there's a meeting today. Do you have that up yet? Um, yeah. So the details is that the host was Kiki McLean, a Democrat public affairs expert and former advisor to both Clintons. Guests included... Herod Harris confidant Minion Moore, two former DNC officials, Donna Brazil, Leah Daughtry, Biden advisor and leader of his outside group, Stephan Stephanie Cutter, former Stephanie Hillary Cutter. These are all Hillary people. S former Hillary spokesperson and Democratic strategist Adrian Elrod and Karen Finney and former Obama White House communications director Jennifer Palmieri. Jesus, there's nobody left. That's everybody. Nobody from the Veep's office was at the dinner, but Harris is attuned to her outside network of supporters. These old friends got together for the first time since the pandemic began celebrating a democratic president after the trump years but the dinner had an urgent purpose harris has been hit with a series of damaging press accounts i love that it's like passive she's been hit <laughs> she's been hit with damaging press accounts they just came out of nowhere she didn't give insane interviews about never having been to europe and uh you know throw things at her staff or whatever she burst into <laughs> cackling laughter uh the um the uh, leaks from administration officials questioning her political judgment and describing rampant dysfunction in her office. The operative spent the dinner discussing how to fight back against negative perceptions and how to help Harris boost her national media footing. Is there there's anybody is there anybody in the Harris stable who were in that meeting? No, but they're they met with her approval. This was an approved by her. That's what it's saying. Like she's. What do you mean, tuned... Karen Finney's not allowed to meet with Stephanie Cutter unless Harris says so? Well, no, but Brazil? she was aware that this was happening. Basically. This meeting, yeah, that this is a meeting of her supporters trying to figure out what to do. Here. High power women in Washington D.C. Right. figuring out damage control, how to fix her. Right. The women discussed how they could leverage Harris's record as a prosecutor, uh, AG, and U.S. senator to blunt criticisms of her performance as vice president, including her answers to questions about the border crisis. Another source familiar with the dinner said attendees saw sexist overtones to the Harris coverage and discussed how they could make sure the press. Knew knows this <laughs> this is very interesting to me so are there any quotes in this um from uh, any of the principals 
uh, there's a source. I don't know if it's one of how principal a source it is, but it's because it's an unnamed source. Many of us lived through the Clinton campaign, said the source, and want to help curb some of the gender dynamics in the press coverage that impacted HRC. It was like we've seen this before. It's subtle, but when things aren't going well for a male politician, we ask very different questions, and they're not held to account the way a woman is. The stories about Harris had gotten Please. so bad by early July. Okay, now, so there's something. Mm-hmm. Something is up with this story. Why does the story exist as it is? I mean, I oh. feel like they're trying to hint to the press in a way. Okay, that's that's could to be tell one them reason. that they're the way that they're covering her is sexist, and they need to get right. their act together. Okay, so the two things could be could be at work here. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, it's weird that you have all these powerful people have a powerhouse dinner, and that everybody immediately knows about it. So I think two p- things could be happening. Cyril, do you need? Can you go now? Okay. Okay. Here you go. I got the door for you. You want to take it out there? Here you go. All set. So I think that they either that it, well, two things this does. One, it gets. I this I, I think this could be a couple of things else. Mm-hmm. One, it gets all the bad stuff about Harris back into the news cycle. So. That could be the reason for the meeting, mm-hmm. to whack Harris, yeah. or two, it could be a showing the press what to do. But I don't think so. I think that these people all got together to torpedo her. Hmm. Interesting. Why would they get together to have a talk about how imbecilic the vice president is <laughs> and what they can do around messaging? They're having a referendum on her job performance. They said that- the point of it was how they can be supportive from the outside. Yeah. They said, yeah. how do we, uh, how can we contribute to make sure that not only is her team making the most of this moment as the first woman of color in the White House, but how can we help from the outside? Uh huh. I'm not, I'm not buying it. I think this is a, I think this is a couple things. How can we help or hurt from the outside? <laughs> I think this is, uh, I think this is them saying, telling her to get her bleep together. If, if it's that benign, but I don't think it is certainly that you certainly don't yeah. have a dinner like this to, uh, first of all, you, 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 no, well, there's no way that that, that this is sincere. They're not saying there's no way. It does say her office didn't have anyone there. And uh, even though she's aware of her outside network of supporters, but it said that her office declined to comment. <laughs> I can understand why they would decline to comment because they don't want to breathe any oxygen into this hit that she just took. If you're trying to elevate a the first vice president woman, you don't go out and leak that you're having crisis dinners about it about how incompetent she is. And also, you don't say in the same thing why the men were so uh you know, men are treated very differently when this happens. Yeah, every guy doesn't run around and have a dinner. When it's happening. And then leak it to the press. You know, this is not... President DeSantis, it doesn't mean that you're going to have every ex-spokesman and campaign person in Washington say, how can we better fix it? And then we'll leak it to the press? Because all this is is an interview. All this is... is With an, an in- unnamed source. Yeah, all this is is an interview to, com- to complain about Harris under the guise of a helpful, supportive sister dinner. <laughs> it is. Women are vicious, huh? Yes. <laughs> Incredible. Plus, I mean, it is interesting to me that this dinner was all women. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, if you're just the crisis team who's trying to solve the problem, like, you could have men- There's no reason not to have men there also. Well. Right? Right. Mm- no, well, well, right. If it were that, which is <laughs> not, of course. That's what I'm saying. Right, right. So it's, it's interesting. A, and you'd think that maybe you'd think to throw a couple in, but no, I think it's supposed to emphasize just how important this is because you, you probably don't know that, th- but this is a first vice f- president who's a woman. Mm-hmm. And I also, think it, first woman of color, also first black woman, also first Asian woman. Right. No, I think the point is mm-hmm. that, hey, uh, Kamala, we're all the true believers in the breaking the glass ceiling we're all the true believers in her story Mm -hmm. and you're effing up her story right now (laughs) we're all washington insiders who know you who are smarter than you who could do this better than you and you're effing this up right now 
I think this was a a, a warning t- shot. Absolutely, with no quotes, no attributions to anybody, <laughs> but a, a really uh, a really <clears throat> politically tuned uh, waiter. Apparently, <laughs> it is interesting because <clears throat> it's incredible how life imitates art. Because I have never, I always thought the show Veep on HBO was like very true to life of mm-hmm. like how politics is, but Kamala is literally Veep. She's like a walking yes. episode of Veep. Oh yes, <laughs> she's totally like vacuous, <laughs> totally half asses it every day and everything. Totally <clears throat> willing to be as low and callous as, as necessary, whatever it takes. You know, right. Um, and un- almost always exposed. It's crazy. Can you read more of this? That was it. That's, oh, that's all it? there was, yeah. Oh, my goodness. How cute is that? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but I don't know. So, like, if if Pelosi gets her ambassadorship, right, mm-hmm. and Catherine Clark becomes speaker, then um, all you need, you, she's now the third person after Biden, who's clearly like on his last legs and Kamala who's a walking political disaster who like I th- I'm pretty sure Biden's entire staff wants to just stab her now <laughs> I don't know I know Ron Klain basically wants her dead but you know I think that um ah, that things could go because if you know if something happens to Biden um and he's and Kamala gets made president, if she goes away before she gets to appoint a new vice president, then it would go to Catherine Clark automatically. Oh, really? Yeah. They don't have to vote on a new one? No. So, oh. well, no. So she appoints a new vice president. But if she gets oh, impeached wait, wait. or whatever before that happens. Hold I don't on. Know. I it's missed that. I have to tweet theory. something. I'm going to ask you about that in a second. It's like a conspiracy theory thing, but I don't know. I. It is interesting how far Catherine Clark has gone, how how quickly, because, you know, when I was first in Melrose, she was the state rep. And, uh, yeah, now she's like all teed up to go, basically. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But it will be interesting. But Pelosi's not. I mean, so I know that. The Republicans are probably going to win the House in 2022, but yeah, if Pelosi accepts something else, but I don't think Pelosi's planning on doing it even if the Democrats do win the House in 2022. Isn't she, like, done now? What are you laughing about now? It's just these tweeters are crazy. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter, at Tom Shattuck. Okay, so let's get into... I love that you found that story, Alice. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Let's get into it, it. Just here's your update on whether the border things are going well at the border. Peter Ducey asks a single question today, and the answer uh, says it all. And the more words, the more it's being said. The more words that we see, it's like it's like panning back. What's the picture, Alice, that was painted with little dots? Pointillism. The walking, the walking in the park one. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. It's a little dots. It was in the one on Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That's a walk in the park. I think it's called that's painted by dots and you look closely right up against it and you can mm-hmm. see all the little dots but then as you back away you can see it, it's no longer pixels you know what i mean it's it becomes clear that it is a scene of a walk in the park it's and, a sunday afternoon on la grande jatte by there you surat go. okay by surat mm-hmm. this is this is when you listen to saki's words here you're you're looking at the pixels but as the words all keep combining together you get the fuller picture. And the fuller picture that you see by the end of this is hordes of migrants with COVID making their way into the United States. There are reports the administration wants to require all foreign visitors to be vaccinated. Would that include migrants arriving in Texas and Arizona and being released into border towns? Well, I know there were a range of reports about this, so let me just give you a little bit of an update on this. One moment. And I know you asked kind of two questions there, and I promise I'll address them both. Mm-hmm. Um, she is already approaching this. So <laughs> I'm really matter of fact about this. Yeah, there's this. already been a lot of words. I'm really a matter of fact about this. You can hear the paper shuffling too. I'm just, I'm. this is so matter of factly answered because it's obviously something that we're not uh, worried about whatsoever. We have totally contained. Listen to how matter of fact I am. There are reports the administration wants to require all foreign visitors to be vaccinated. Would that include migrants arriving 
in Texas and Arizona and being released into Boulder County? Well, I know there were a range of reports about this, so let me just give you a little bit of an update on Matter this. Matter of fact. One moment. And I know you asked kind of two questions there, and I promise I'll address them both. Uh, we, one, let me reiterate, and I know Francesca asked a question about this the other day, um, the importance of international travel. Um, given where we are today with the Delta variant, we will uh, plan to maintain existing travel restrictions at this point. Uh, however, what our interagency working groups are focused on, and this is, I think, what was reported, uh, is uh, working to develop a plan for a consistent and safe international travel policy. And that will be done through the prism of uh, providing consistent guidance, equitable guidance, digestible okay. guidance. And there's a lot of as confusion. As long as it's digestible. What is, does that mean? What is digestible guidance? Digestible means you can, like, take it in and learn how to implement it easily. That it's doesn't sound uh, bureaucratic bureaucratic at all about what the restrictions are now and you all have asked a lot of good questions about it because it feels inconsistent and it is um but that's what our focus is so now that i've said the part about stuff that you already know i've now asked the question that you asked right and now that i've said that part uh, let me dust you crop dust you with a whole bunch of words about the crucial thing you really asked which is COVID uh, people storming and swarming across the border. That uh, is, is certainly under strong consideration, but it is under a, um, a policy process review right now that I won't uh, get ahead of myself. Uh, as it relates to, I know there was also reporting about the vaccination of uh, migrants. That's not what the CBP is doing. There are huh. NGOs and other international uh, organizations who are vaccinating uh, migrants uh, as they come across the border and as they work in partnership with us. Certainly that helps keep a range of people safe in the, in the country. There are NGOs vaccinating some <laughs> migrants. I thought keeps... we were telling them not to come. So why are we telling them to get vaccinated we're... before they come? Isn't this like giving the get, condoms the to are... the high schoolers? The it's the like, NGOs... don't have sex, but here are the condoms. The NGOs in case. are here on this side. Uh, some of them are in Mexico also. But so they're coming. These are but these people coming over the border, like Catholic Charities, mm -hmm. for instance, is one of the groups yeah. that might help people once they come out across the border. Mm -hmm. The NGOs are doing some people. They're doing how many? A range of people. Mm -hmm. A range of people. Well, so, there's a range between 2 and 7%, 1 and 4%, 3 and 80%. What does a range of people actually mean? Do nah. you think that it's keeping people safe from McAllen, Texas, where 7,000 confirmed COVID positive migrants have been released into the city since February, 1,500 in the last seven days? Well, I think it's important to note what's actually happening in McAllen. So there's actually been... Uh, a, they signed a disaster declaration approved setting up a temporary emergency shelter to provide a space to create an isolated space to mitigate uh, this issue. And what happens is uh, DHS, and this is the process of what happens, uh, the agency, one, we're continuing to enforce Title 42, uh, resulting first in the expulsion of the vast majority of those encountered at the border. Uh, we also, uh, CBP also provides migrants who can't be expelled under Title 42 uh, with PPE. They're required to wear the PPE. If any exhibit signs of illness in CP, C, CBP uh, custody, they're referred to local health systems for appropriate testing, diagnosis, isolation, and treatment. And obviously, there are steps taken as needed, as this is uh, certainly evidence of. I think we got to keep okay. chugging here. I mean, yeah, that's how we know they're COVID positive is they were tested and they are now quarantining them. But they also were interacting with a whole group of migrants. So what they're doing, because so I watched some of this debate unfold on Twitter because Bill Malugan of mm -hmm. Fox L.A., um, has been tweeting about this. He's like got sources in McAllen who are giving him this info. And yeah, they've made they put out a disaster declaration because they have so many COVID positive migrants here. Now, people are saying these aren't illegal immigrants, they're legal immigrants. And the reason they're saying that is because they've applied for uh, asylum. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that because they've applied for asylum, they're not legally allowed to be in the country. Which, like, kind of is true, but they haven't had their asylum claims approved yet, and this is dependent on them actually showing up for their court dates, and many of them probably don't really qualify for asylum. Right. Is the problem. So, I mean, they're about to be illegal. That's a tenuous definition of legal versus illegal immigrant to start with, but, you know, be that as it may, assume they're all about to get their asylum claims met, right? And that part is true, which not but so they're coming in a big group they're being bussed in together they're being housed together and now they're showing signs of 
illness and then they get tested for COVID and then if they're positive, then they're quarantined. But they were just around like a bunch of other thousands of people that right. are there. Quarantine and or referred to, and you're right, right, around thousands of other people, some of whom are not bothering to go through any ports of entries. Right. Some of whom are just huffing it straight through or across the river or just to, in between fencing and between Border Patrol mm -hmm. agents. I mean, yeah, these are the ones that have applied for asylum. So it's like, it, you know, at some point this becomes semantics, right? We're talking about people who are just showing up in the country and demanding to be allowed to stay here and not going through a normal immigration process because you're supposed to apply from asylum from where you are. You're mm -hmm. not really supposed to just show up and do it, but people do. You can do it at the port of entry. It's allowed. Yeah, you're allowed to do it that way. It, I mean, it's true, but but it's, uh, you know, but a lot of them know that they don't qualify for asylum and and they're just doing it so that they can get in and then stay. I think I read a statistic that 13% of the people that have had court dates again so far have showed up for the court dates now. So, <laughs> you know, and, you know, were they COVID positive? Were they not? We don't know. Were they, were they vaccinated? So I did read an article today about how in so a range, Tijuana they're vaccinated. So a range of people have shown up people. for the court dates. A range mm -hmm. of migrants. Yeah, and we're holding as many dates. kids in cages as we have ever now at this i think we're at sixteen thousand or so kids in cages at the moment but it this is really like a disaster and the root causes thing is not i mean i know they said it's not like a light switch that it's going to solve the problem right away but like could they give us a timeline of so, so when actually, they think the this, root causes will uh work out here maybe this actually also could be this makes me think that maybe the meeting of the beltway gals is more the shot at Biden. For giving her this job. Yeah, for well, giving her this job or for handling it like this. Saying we've got the first female VP out there and you're handling this by sending her to Guatemala to talk about trans rights. <laughs> it could be. I mean, she is doing her own part to do absolutely to F this up as well my gut sense is that those type of people are more biden type of people than kamala harris type of people just because they're like old washington hands you know mm. um so my guess is that they're probably more on his team and that's who he's got and, in his administration you know, you know what else i hate to be like this and mm -hmm. i don't want to do any kind of slamming uh, uh shaming to anybody but there's a chance that these people, like Donna Brazil, an activist, worked her way up, became in the mm -hmm. Clinton team, whatever, et cetera. Um, and and it's Stephanie Cutter, you know, has been a comms person forever. And then Jennifer Palmieri, Clinton loyals forever. Th uh, these these are thinking women. These are smart women. Yeah. And And there is a... There's a chance that they've seen, they know what it took for them to ascend to to very high power circles, mm -hmm. and they knew what well, they watched Hillary Clinton, you know, being with the moron from the Hornball. You guess he's not a moron from <laughs> from Arkansas. Well, he's governor. She's just got has a law firm job. She follows him to Washington. He humiliates her. She perseveres. Gets to be a senator. Uh, I think you could probably say an effective senator. I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, and she does that, and she runs for president, gets T-boned by Barack Obama. Then she, at an advanced stage, not great health, she goes out and tries it again. And she took to, to be uh, president, and then Trump just nails her. And they look at somebody like Hillary and say, this woman has worked so hard. She's an accomplished woman. She, of the two people, and I've talked to people who've known the Clintons, of the two people, people said, you want to be in the conversation with Hillary, not mm -hmm. the conversation with Bill. Right. Especially if you're a young woman, I <laughs> think. Um, so, yeah, and people I think who that, uh, read my Substack guest piece on Tom's thing and yes. didn't, haven't met people like that, I can. Bill Clinton is the archetype. Absolutely. So I think that they've seen Hillary and said, this is the model for success. And she would have had it had it not been for the Russians and Trump. And Obama, who really backstabbed her, stabbed her because she brought him into the fault. She brought him into prominence, and mm -hmm. he screwed her. I, I think they look at Hillary and say, 
Hillary deserved better. Hillary deserved to be a heavy at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And then they look at Kamala and say, this, this person, mm -hmm. I this mean, person who ascended with the help of guys like Willie Brown mm -hmm. in San Fran. And I think that, I mean, I, it, you call it like a uh, mean girls, whatever. I think they look at her and they say, this is a cheap version of female success and it's not earned and we don't like it well and i think there might also be a sense of urgency if maybe they know stuff that we don't know about biden's condition right now and how much mm -hmm. time they have of the biden administration oh, I see. left Ooh, here well i like that oh was that what this is Maybe. Is that what this is? Maybe they're saying we, you know, Biden's time I, is gonna, running I'm gonna out. I'm going to add that and... to my tweet, Alice. Do you mind? Go or ahead. Do you want to tweet add it to your tweet. No, you can go ahead. Mm. Alice, you don't have to stop while I'm tweeting. You can, <laughs> well, you can why are you tweeting in the middle of the show? No, because I, I had an Epiphone, or you had an Epiphone, and I'm stealing it. Well, why do you get to steal my Epiphone? I don't know. Um, speaking of... Uh, really empowered, wonderful women in politics. Uh, Ilan Omar tweeted and then deleted a tweet uh, from... She retweeted Steve King from Iowa, the disgraced congressman. Yes. Complaining about how Israel doesn't let a gold medalist get married there because, like, you know, his mom's not Jewish, so he doesn't really count under Orthodox Jewish law, and he can't get married in Israel, and blah, blah, blah. And, like, so she tweeted a... Uh, a picture of she retweeted his tweet with a picture of her and Rashida Tlaib like making like oh snap faces kind of at it so uh and he's fully acknowledged I believe Steve King by the left to be a white supremacist isn't that what they believe he is yeah it's so by the way it is he an anti-semite Steve King I don't really think so. I don't know, but I know I'm, I was told he was. I've interviewed him like five thousand times, and I always thought he was a good interview. And I, I, I got, must have missed the blatant anti-Semitism. But I don't know. But, I don't know exactly what he did. That was so bad. But, um, but the left has a big problem with him. Didn't he get all his committee assignments stripped and everything else? Yeah, I thought he got booted. I didn't. Even... Well, yeah, he lost his primary then. I think. Um, and then. So, but then she tweeted and then deleted it because she realized that she tweeted somebody that she had been calling a big racist, th their criticism of Israel, and uh, retweeted it to agree. And so then <laughs> she deleted it. But, uh, yeah. But, like, how many anti-Semitic slip-ups can one person have? Well, you know. Before you just draw the obvious conclusion with her. With Ilhan? Yeah. Pelosi's afraid of her. And now, after the squad victory, I, I, she'll be... Remember, last year when Ilhan Omar tweeted or said something anti-Semitic, everybody had to stop Apologize doing violence. Apologize yes. for uh, Islamophobia. Yes, absolutely. That's how this works now. <laughs> They're not bringing their best. All right, let's work, uh, let's work through this. Uh, this uh, I mean, this Phil Murphy thing is just him yelling at, I guess, anti-vaxxers. Please get vaccinated. Period. These folks back there have lost their mind. You've lost your minds. You are the ultimate knuckleheads. And because of what you say, are saying and standing for, people are losing their life. People are losing their life. And you have to know that. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Yeah, it's the people looking in the mirror who are losing their life, Phil. <laughs> what does he want? By the way, is, 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 are people who are black and brown people who don't want to get vaccinated, are they losing their minds, too? Are they knuckleheads, too? Well, Boston Mayor Kim Janney got in trouble for this. Did you see this? Did she apologize now over this? Yeah, I saw it. She's a whack job. It's, I haven't been paying attention. So she to... basically said that um, that having like required a vaccine pass in Boston, mm -hmm. because there are or a lot of black people who don't want to get vaccinated would be like Jim Crow and segregation and slavery all over again. And she's now walked that back and apologized the globe. So I don't, she apologized. Uh, I don't like to invoke Jim Crow and slavery. It's not the same, you know, not <laughs> being able to, uh, to go to Durgan park for clam chowder is not the same as Jim Crow. That said, it would be discriminatory. Against um, yeah. black and brown people, absolutely. So I read a statistic that like 78% of black people aren't vaccinated right mm -hmm. now. And so, 
or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe it's 28% are vaccinated and 72 aren't. I might have the number not, but it's, you know, roughly three quarters of black people aren't vaccinated. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's a problem if you're going to say that, you know, only the select 25% of black people can go to restaurants in New York City. I would think that that would be like, well, because for example, on the left, they believe in the dissent on the Supreme Court decision about the Arizona voter law that, um, you know, said that you had to vote in your own precinct. The legal argument presented in that case that the dissent from the liberals agreed with was that the law that you have to vote in your correct precinct is discriminatory because uh, 90 90- Nine percent of white people can figure out what precinct to vote in, but only 98 percent of black people can figure out what precinct to vote in. So twice as many black people are being excluded from voting as white people for the their percent of the population. So I would think that if it's discriminatory to have a law that bars two percent of black people from voting, that it would I would think be discriminatory to have a law that bars 72% of black people from being able to go into stores and (laughs) restaurants. I would think. (laughs) But what do I know? It just seems like that's kind of a bigger issue. Uh, And I, like, so first of all, I think that this is going to fall apart when people realize how many black and brown people are not vaccinated, that it's not just Trump supporters. And I also think... Well, you know what this, Alice, talk about this, if there, Mm -hmm. this would give Trump an opportunity. Yeah, with black voters. Absolutely. So you're welcome to my events. And, or in Ron DeSantis, you, oh, who's totally. against all mandates and vaccine passports and everything right. else. And this would have – it's interesting because you remember back in 2016 mm-hmm. or 2016 or 2017, that Tom Hanks thing on SNL where it was he and the black women. Yep. And they it were was the, Black so, Jeopardy. Right, it Black was, Jeopardy. And, they sh- mm-hmm. and, they, and all the, the, the whole gist was that the, there were so many cultural similarities. Right. That, you know, that aside from the Make America Great Again hat, there wasn't, like, culturally as big a difference between Trump voters and, you know, an average black person in a similar area of the country that and, like, the limousine liberals. That that's who's actually different, that the, mm-hmm. the divisions are shifting. And, like, Trump made a lot of progress with those groups. So if liberals decide to move in a direction that alienates them more from those groups of people than, than they have been, you know, I think that presents a really big problem for them, especially, especially if they lose all the suburbs on top of it, which looks like where they're going with all these, uh, first of all, like the mask mandates in schools, if they do vaccine requirements in these schools in rich suburbs i I don't think that that's gonna fly but people are sick of the masks on their kids people are sick of this critical race theory stuff people are sick of like the gender ideology being forced on their kids in schools like if you lose those suburban moms that you gained in order to lose more working class people then you know that's that's, I think, a big problem for them. And, you know, I think DeSantis is really well positioned right now for that because, uh, you know, I think his response with the Biden thing when he they told him to get out of the way was absolutely, absolutely right. You know, where he didn't like I feel like if it was a Mitt Romney, he would have been like, how dare you? I'm not standing in the way of anyone being vaccinated and like accept their framing. But he hasn't done that. He hasn't even taken the time to defend the fact that he's been pushing the vaccine and pro vaccine from the start. And he's just against mandates. You know, because he because his record stands for itself there. He refuses to accept the framing of their question. He says, of course, I'm standing in your way. I'm standing in your way against keeping kids out of schools. I'm standing in your way against, you know, not giving parents the choice to put a mask on their kid or not to get their kid vaccinated or not. And I think that's exactly where he needs to be, because I think people really care about that. So now this whole drama in Florida and uh, somebody sent me like a friend of a friend who's like, against masks in Florida schools about this whole thing because it's uh, DeSantis said he would cut off school districts funding if mm-hmm. they uh, did mask mandates that they have to leave it up to parents to put a right. mask on their kid or not but the Biden administration said that they're going to go over his head and give the money to the schools anyway if he cuts off funding so now DeSantis's board of education is like having an emergency meeting to see what they can do to what they want to do now is uh, tie the funding to the students 
so that if people now they're essentially saying um, if Biden's doing this and is going to force the school districts to allow mask mandates over our head as the government of Florida will allow you parents to take your kids out of those schools and take the money with you Ooh. to go to private school, to homeschool, to hire a tutor, whatever you want to do. Nice. What a war. So, Is yeah. This the end of the education <laughs> I hope so. I really hope so. It's been too long. There was also drama. As you know, one of the big voices on this on Twitter is uh, that school choice advocate Corey DeAngelis on Twitter. Uh, okay. Have you heard of him? He's been advocating yeah, for the school so. choice stuff for years now. But um, so he tweeted about this, this like Board of Education thing, which is why I saw it. And this uh, lefty person who is one of the writers from Big Bang Theory, who's decided mm-hmm. to become a big political know-it-all, was like, Ooh, now we're combining the Republican war on education with the Republican, you know, goal of killing children. Perfect or whatever. And so then people like responded back to point out that he had gone to private school. (laughs) (laughs) And so uh, really shouldn't probably be commenting, at which point he deleted his tweet and said he realized that. Um, Corey DeAngelis was in QAnon, and so he wasn't going to respond to him anymore. Oh, of course. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so now reel uh, Nicole Solas into this. Mm-hmm. You reel her in. You, I, you her? looked at the story. I didn't look at the story yet. Uh, Nicole Solas um, is a parent who had foyered a bunch of uh, her school committee's um, meeting minutes, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And because she wanted to know if they were teaching critical race theory. In Rhode Island, yeah. Rhode Island, exactly. So they filed a lawsuit against her um, a couple weeks ago, I think. Yeah, the teachers' union filed right. a lawsuit against because a she's parent. Following, because she wants to see the curriculum. And now they've done, filed another lawsuit against her. Mm-hmm. Because this is a parent who wants to know what the curriculum is. Teachers' union, and I've seen teachers on the local patch there say, there no teacher teaches that, no teacher teaches that, there's this or that. But then I saw a somebody Google it and said, said, okay, so this teacher says that she respectfully disagrees with the critical race theory is being taught in school. Um, and she said anyone doing accurate research could do it right now. So this guy, a commenter said, challenge accepted. A very simple search finds that at their annual meeting this week, the National Education Association passed the plan to fight back against anti-CRT rhetoric, which in part states the association will further convey that in teaching these topics, it is reasonable and appropriate for curriculum to be informed by academic frameworks for understanding and interpreting the impact of the past on current society, including critical race theory. So in other words, they're not teaching it, but they're not going to stop. Uh, he I love sa- that. That's what sa- the big teachers' unions say, too. Yep. He says, no other framework is mentioned, and this entire plan is littered with the words, phrases, and sentences of CRT doctrine, such as study that critiques empire, white supremacy, anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, racism, patriarchy, cis-hetero patriarchy, mm-hmm. capitalism, uh, ableism, anthropocentrism, holy frig, in other forms of power and oppression at the intersections of our society, and that we oppose those attempts to ban critical race theory and or the 1619 Project. Well, geez, you know? <laughs> so anyway, they're suing her to shut her up because she's asking for the information on this stuff. And, of course, I asked her to... Oh, dang. I asked her if she... Really, Tom? Dinkhead. What happened? Nothing. I closed my freaking Facebook account. It's the one thing I needed to be reading at this moment, and of course. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, I'm not happy. So maybe we'll have her on at some point. Well, I've asked her, and she said she can't do it tonight. But she said it's incredible, um, it, it, what's happening, and that she will, uh, that she gave me a person to reach out to to talk to her. So she must be a monkey muck or something because she's like excited about this lawsuit. Mm-hmm. Um, also, most Alice, of the, I mean, most of the. Like, I'm a concerned parent when I go to the school, too. But, like, I obviously have an agenda when I, like, file my public right. records requests or whatever. Because I'm a jerk. But Is there anything mm-hmm. – do you have any piece of – I have two pieces of business to do before we leave. Do you have any pieces of business? Um. So I had a couple good emails that I wanted to get to. Oh, okay. Um, which included um, 
our friend of the show, Jim, um, not someone we know in person, but who was emailed before, is one of the landlords the CDC and the left are out to screw. He has two units and a duplex. He's been fortunate um, that his tenants have been good. Uh, but he talks about being a landlord and how, like, everyone hates him in this neighborhood um, <laughs> because, like, they just hate neighbors. He says, I have an elderly friend on the street who says they're jealous, but this investment didn't just happen. It wasn't inherited. It was hard work. He says, I don't see this anti-landlord culture as limited to the pandemic. I follow the local statehouse developments relative to the bills to create rent control, abolish no-cause evictions, eliminate credit screenings, prohibit court eviction reports, basically making it impossible to get someone out. Um, uh, his rep is Jamie Eldridge, so that explains why he's mm -hmm. in trouble for that. But um, he says they're notoriously favoring the legislation as recently as the last session. He says in the event that these moratoriums expire, the vacancy market is going to explode and landlords are going to have a substantial crop of evicted tenants to screen through. It's called unintended consequences. With all this stuff happening now, I'm looking to cash out. I have two tenants that don't want to move, but if they do, I'm splitting into condos and selling. He says I don't need this aggravation from people who hate me for no cause. Right. And also there's a couple of callers mentioned that for, for landlords, they can go to find court filings to see who's been evicted and who hasn't. Mm -hmm. He also says that there is an economic consequence that he hasn't seen people talking about, which is a good point, that when he got his initial loan to buy the house, the bank looks at, they'll count up to 75% of the potential rental income as a basis to pay. So like what you would be able to get mm -hmm. so that they know how much house to sell you. The theory being that there would be anticipated loss from vacancies. At that time, it would never have occurred to me or to the bank that the CDC could eliminate rent. I was worried about the Arabs New York or catastrophic event risk. But now with the flu and the CDC, even just that can take us out. Moving forward, the banks are probably going to want to see a larger capital backing to cover the potential loss of income in these scenarios. That is going to take the small investor out of the market. Jeez. It's a great point. Yeah, it is. Nice. Thank you for the email. That is a, it was great uh, content. Did you have another one? No. Um, yes, I have another one um, because we had mentioned how terrible the Massachusetts unemployment system was mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Um, Tom wrote to us a different time. Uh, Not me, you're saying. Yeah, okay. no. This Tom is an IT manager who was unlucky enough to have his position eliminated last June. He was paid a lump sum in return for signing a waiver of liability. We're familiar with that. That's typical in a layoff. Myself and another IT manager were put through the same process. Anyway, because I signed a waiver, I was supposed to be able to collect right away. Here I sit nine weeks later on hold in the process I claim every week. There is no one to talk to to get a status, and you will be processed in the order received. You have to get to eight weeks before you can escalate. Oh, I asked for the escalation and then awful. asked what changes now. I was told we're really busy. We have no way to tell you where you are in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> Having flashbacks. We're we're familiar with that. I spent Believe on me. hold. Yes. Oh. I finally got someone who told me that their system is unchanged from 1996 until today. Oh, fantastic. So that's the way it is. Any suggestions would be helpful. There's no way to get through to a human. Well, I can tell you, Tom, and I'll write this back in an email. Um, he says he's not you, although he is of a similar build. Good I'll, man, I'll reply Tom. to his email as well, but I'm going to say this on the show for anyone else who is struggling with this because we went through this for months and months and months mm -hmm. and could not get it resolved. We had somebody else filing under Tom's name and we could not get to a human who could do anything about it. And uh, the only way, the, literally the only way we were able to do it was through our state rep. Is I talked right. to my state rep's office and they have a legislative liaison that can talk to humans in the office and deal with it for you and light a fire under them to deal with your problem. There you go. So um, that would be my advice, um, would be to make friends with your state rep and get them to do yeah, something Yeah, that's about what they're it. there for, Tom. You know, they're there to handle this crap yeah. and cut through so, the So Because it's ridiculous. It's yes. absolutely ridiculous. The system has been swamped for over a year now, and it's impossible to deal with. Yeah. So... Um, Poor guy. Man, I'm sorry. I feel your pain. Luckily, you and I are both ripped. So at least we look good while it's happening. <laughs> I know. Lucky guy. So those guy. are your two things. Can okay. I get to my housekeeping? Yes. Okay. One. Okay. Uh, one, very quickly, uh, there's a picture out of the bill signing. Bills, Biden signs bill awarding congressional gold medals to Capitol and Metro Police who responded to one six. And he's outside in the Rose Garden on a desk signing a bunch of, uh, signing the thing, mm -hmm. handing out pens. Around him are uh, the families of uh, the Capitol Police, some uh, some families, some po politicians. Pelosi's there as well. Uh, Klobuchar is there as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's some kids, the kids of some of the Capitol Police who are getting these medals, etc. Mm -hmm. Guess 
who to a person is not wearing a mask and to a person is wearing a mask? Um, the kids are wearing masks. That's correct. <laughs> and the adults all are not wearing masks. That's correct. Exactly. Well, the adults, are, of course, are enjoying a photo op, so they're not going to wear masks. <laughs> These politicians. Oh, there's Kamala back there. She's not wearing a mask either. Pelosi's not wearing a mask. Klobuchar's not wearing a mask. Biden's not wearing a mask. The kids are all masked up. Isn't that perfect? I am sorry, but I... The, it really bothers me how badly kids have been treated during this pandemic. Yeah. It really bothers me because I think it says a lot about you as a person, how you want to treat kids. And the utter disdain for the needs of children during all this happening is just embarrassing. And the idea that you're going to walk around as a vaccinated person with no mask on and make your kid wear a mask. And that's why, like, with softball, they had you and the other coaches wearing masks because they were like, well, if the kids are wearing them, it only feels right that we wear them. Because they do sense in their heart that there is something terrible about making the kid wear a mask. Yes, great point. And that it's exacerbated when they're not wearing a mask. But it doesn't occur to them, of course, that they could just not have the kid wear a mask. Right. That That's, you know, not something that's in their mind. So here's my two things. But can okay. I finish my Sorry. one thought on that, though? Which is that I am starting, and this is what Bethany Mandel said when she was on the phone with me. Um, I am starting regarding the masks on kids to be the squeaky wheel starting right now. Which is, I am emailing our Museum of Science and Aquarium membership services and letting them know that the reason why I haven't renewed and I'm not renewing is because they still have mask mandates and that they can send me another email when the mask mandates go away and maybe I'll renew the hundreds of dollars of memberships that we have with them so that uh, so that we can go back but I'm not doing it until they lift the mask mandates and I've similarly emailed like the other activities that have our kids sign up and say I'd love to sign my kid up but I'm not going to do it if you make them wear a mask so you have to tell me now that during this whole sports season or during this whole activity or Something this smells class, great. Is that you? Sally's stolen my perfume I believe. Oh really? <laughs> Something smells okay. familiar. So you're on the war path I'm as far as masks on, a, go. on email campaign about masks, yes. Here's my two things. Mm -hmm. uh, one is this. Um, I am going to redouble. Me and Alice are having a creative session to to make sure that we can stay off off on top of the sub stack. Because we, we at least do two a week, but the deal is to do three a week. But it's mm -hmm. getting more difficult to do that during the week because stuff keeps happening. So we're going to find a way to make sure that we get those three out per week. Uh, it it's just gotten with the world tough to do. So there's my interview? what child interview and how it is for the masks. Oh, not at the moment. Yeah. Sally. we'll do it for maybe next time. Yeah, next time. we're already like over time here. Number two, mm -hmm. I have a question for Alice Shattuck. Mm -hmm. One, why did you? Uh, uh, how long have you been storing articles of clothing in the toilet? <laughs> and two, what else do you store in the toilet? I. Alice came to me today, <laughs> and she said, as if this wasn't bizarre, I'm here getting sound for the podcast, and she said, oh, by the way, <laughs> did you see underwear in the toilet, and did you flush it, maybe? And I said, uh, I don't I don't think so. She said, okay, because well, Cyril's underwear was in the toilet, which seems like the kind of thing I should know before I'm using toilets. But that's fine. It was she, visible. She keeps the underwear in the toilet. And I would <laughs> no, suggest you, you keep, keep it keep, there like long term. I would term. suggest Alice, that you keep stuff in non flushable areas of the I house. am potty training a child right now. We are in a potty training period. And I don't recall I this left, part of potty training. I as a left kid. the underwear to soak while I got him dressed in his other clothes so that it would be easier to clean. I'm trying to stay away from any explicit terminology okay. here. So you left the and underwear. when I came back, it was gone. It's not a vestibule <laughs> for cleaning. Where would you like me to clean it, I don't it, know. Honey? Is there a brook around here? <laughs> what are you leaving things to soak in a toilet? For like a what few you... minutes. That is crazy. That's like sleeping in the uh, turret of a tank gun. For like a few I mean, minutes, I left it so that the, the stuff the, would the, come the... off it. The um the barrel you know of next a cannon. Time, next My time goodness. I'll give it to you to scrub off. This, okay. That, the, this is so you. Of course <laughs> you scrape of course. off everything without you so without any without any what? water on it. What are you talking about? <laughs> what else do you keep in the toilet just for a little while that I should be looking out for, Alice? 
<laughs> Nothing. <laughs> You yes, know you what? Do. do you want to handle the potty is, training? Since you is... you seem to have a lot of thoughts on how the potty <laughs> training should go. I was letting it soak. For, I let things soak. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me before we were married that sometimes I let things soak in the toilet, Alice? Before we were married, <laughs> yes, least, I didn't <laughs> soak things in the toilet because I didn't have children that I was you, potty Sally, training, you which soak, is your fault. Do you store things short-term <laughs> storage in the toilet as well? Well, how much stuff have we lost around here, Alice? Because I mistakenly thought that the toilet... Was uh, to be used for did you uh, not, refuse. Did you, did you not see that there was a pair of soiled I, underwear in there? Like, whatever. No, Alice. I think maybe. Is there anything else that anybody in the house needs to know? I'll go check okay. if it's in the septic okay. tank. I guess. Do you do you keep anything in the gas tank of the car? <laughs> Yes, I did tie the car together with a headband on our road trip. <sighs> if you guys have any creative places to store things that nobody would ever consider looking, I don't know how you're going to beat that, but I'd love your submissions. Yes, submit those to us on Twitter at Burn Barrel Pod or Facebook.com slash Burn Barrel Podcast. You can also email them to Burn Barrel Podcast at gmail.com or... Uh, uh, comment on our youtube i guess just too. put it away else okay just close this out okay how do you like attack me when i'm trying to do the end of the show <laughs>